There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Well, happy 2022. Bill is back. Bill is joining us as usual from Nairobi. Welcome back, Bill. Always a pleasure to be back. You're a very popular guest on my Bite Size Book Chat, so uh, <laughs> thank you for coming back. And you are here today to talk about a really interesting book that I have never heard anything about. On characteristically, for you, I think, and certainly for your appearances on my channel, it's a work of nonfiction. It is called yeah. A Face for Picasso, Coming of Age mm -hmm. with Cruzon Syndrome by Ariel Henley. And I don't have anybody um, on my Goodreads except you who has read it and uh, never heard anybody talk about it on BookTube. So this is an exclusive. Bill, tell us about this book. <laughs> so we follow as the author is a memoir, coming of age memoir. Yeah. And we follow her as she grapples with her traumatic surgeries that happened to her from such a young age. She, she has a twin sister. So when... The parents first, when she first came to the world, the parents took, took her to specialists because their faces started, um, started not being like you normal, know, like structural, like imperfection. So they were worried. Then the doctor said like, it will keep progressing, it will keep changing. And they have to have multiple surgeries throughout their lives. Through, so we chronicle the surgery mostly and her experience, also the sisters, the twin sister going to school, just being feeling outside from everyone else, and it's so heartbreaking. Yeah, from such a young age, and you see how she gets angry. She has an angry stage because every time she tries something new, like join, let's say, like join the cheerleading squad. There's a section where they have a cheerleader, cheerleader tryout and. You can clearly tell that the other, <laughs> the coaches or the people surrounding them are uncomfortable. Like, why are you trying out? Like, you are not to the standards of, like, the, the norm, yeah? You're not part of us. Like, it's, there's a lot to dissect in this. The title is actually fascinating because she references Picasso because Picasso was famous for drawing this disfigured figures very much mirror her like imperfection and she goes through the history of Picasso how he treated the women he was misogynistic like very abusive and he's renowned for this part when her face is being shunned upon Picasso drew these images of like women fragmented and was lauded and praised so in a way Ariel is trying to recapture or to rewrite that segment that's why the face of Picasso and the idea of like beauty is symmetrical like you can measure the beauty the standards of it like it's mathematical is also discussed there's so much she tackles but not in a dense way it's very approachable and very very honest I think that's the word it's very honest yeah she and her twin sister, they were diagnosed at the age of eight months, but were they yes. born with a disfigurement already? No, I think developed. they just appeared normal. It started developing slowly. Developing fairly early. Yeah. Though. yeah, they are fairly early. And every stage of their life, is surgery. Very intense, dangerous, life-threatening surgeries. When they're six years old, one, one day she goes, she goes to the mom and she's like, something is coming out of my gum. She's like, something is poking out. And there's like just a tooth, honey. And then it's like, no, there's something, there's something coming out between the nose and the gum. And it's not a, like, it's not a cheap sabon. And then she goes to like the specialist and they just, another thing, they just brush it off because they think it's not that serious or they downplay her plea. Then they find out the tooth growing out from inside. A nose, you know, like such shocking moments and they have to do surgery again. And whenever they grow into another stage, let's say like teenagehood or like they become teenagers, they need to 
change that. Absolutely. Yeah, completely. And they have to miss school and come back. And some teachers don't understand that. She's very honest about the privilege she can afford surgery. She is not like impoverished, you know? The family supports her even when the surgery, she's like, no, I need this surgery. The mom will go. They will work extra hard to like provide what they need. But to some extent, it was just about self-love. It was about finding beauty in in perfection, you know, writing her story. Yeah. And I wish you could go. The adult sections were rushed. So we spent more time with her during that teenage years. Wish you could get an extension of it. I was hankering for more, but it's well, good that she, yeah, that she just shared that piece of perspective because we rarely get that section fleshed out more because memoirs usually tackle like adulthood. Most of the ones I've read. Maybe there'll be a sequel. Yeah, I hope so. Like, because I think she has such a distinct voice. Even when I left the book, it, her voice still rings. And it's not profound, it's very quiet, it's very timid, and it speaks to just how, and it honestly captures experience. Have you read the middle grade novel Wonder by, I think it's initials, a woman's initials, RJ, Mm -hmm. I think, Palaccio? No. I don't know if it's the same type of genetic disorder that causes this Mm -hmm. young boy, this very similar kind of uh, yeah, face yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah. about his struggles as a middle grader powerful yeah wow that sounds like something yeah and i think there's there's richness in that. telling a story from that perspective from a child's perspective it's it, it really it really raises up questions that, like how hard it is like coming to this world and facing this <laughs> these ideas that are constantly shoved at them to listen to those stories. I just want to, to have an understanding of them. So I'm prioritizing more stories like this. Yeah. It came out in November. And yeah. she is also a contributor to um, an anthology of first person stories called Disability. Yeah, it's really Disability. Disability. Yeah. I want yeah, to read Which that. I've heard about that one. Yeah. Oh, and she's very active on Goodreads. Right now, she is reading, it looks like a romance novel. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, her whole, she's got a whole thing on there, what she's reading. So you can check that out. Does she do the audio narration? Yes. yes. That's how I said. Yeah, it's, it's very good. Yeah. It's quiet, timid, and honest. And you have, it forces you to pay attention, not just to use it as a background noise. The first two sentences of the synopsis on goodreads i am ugly there's a mathematical equation yeah from there. yeah and she talks about that like she dissects that throughout referencing picasso specifically because she disagrees with picasso's philosophy and she just brings out she, she paints picasso as this horrible person <laughs> and and she she dives into picasso's relationships the women who were pretty much destroyed their affairs she was like a complete fiasco of it. i learned so much about picasso because i knew picasso the figure but i never knew about his life i didn't dive in and she did a great job of pairing her experiences with picasso's painting with picasso's life and i think that's such a nice angle because she dissects beauty in, in a mathematical formula but in like how we value, how we look at people like Picasso and like see, like, oh, they captured something when. Also that art versus artist, you know, like how, if the artist, artist is, uh, is not a good person, <laughs> say that. The well, artist is not so a good person. You, yeah. have, <laughs> you have explained it. I, I assumed that it, it was but a throwaway line and just to evince some humor, but in fact, it's quite a deep, thematic yeah. to the memoir it's, yeah the yeah it's and she she came across Picasso through her art teacher at a very young age and she went down this rabbit hole and it sort of formed her ideas on beauty and how she sees herself because she could see herself in a Picasso painting you know and I think that's such a powerful sentiment but she realized that Picasso wasn't capturing <laughs> 
wasn't such a nice person by the she, misogyny and all that horrible stuff but she could still see herself Picasso was one of the few painters who painted what when what she truly looks like to the outside world yeah sounds so incredibly powerful and uh, thank you for telling us about it bill <laughs> yeah it's a good one people should definitely read it thank you well, i'm delighted to welcome back to my channel kiera from dublin welcome back kiera Hi, Sean. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's so nice to have you back. And I mispronounced your name last time, and it's a little bit difficult to say, but how did I do? Very well. Great. Can you say it slowly? Chiara. Okay. It's lovely when you say it. Thank you. And uh, we are here to talk about a book that, at the time of taping, isn't even out yet. It comes out October 7th. I imagine by the time I get this video up, it will be out, a new release, Burnt Coat by Sarah Hall. Sarah Hall is a British novelist that I'm vaguely aware of, but haven't read anything by except maybe one short story. And you love this. Tell yes, us I thought why. it was a very good book. Yes. Tell us why. Uh, it is a pandemic novel and uh, a very good pandemic novel. Everything is uh, viewed in retrospect from the point of view of a 59 year old artist who went through a pandemic. And she's now ill with the consequences of uh, the virus that has been dormant in her body and then waking up again. And so she goes back to her life and tells us her life story. Okay. She writes wonderfully. She wrote this, you told me before we started. She wrote this in response to the current coronavirus pandemic. Is she writing about the current coronavirus pandemic? No, uh, I think... Uh, our pandemic was just an inspiration because the virus that we find in the book is way stronger, more virulent, Ooh. and uh, has uh, these you know, just longer term consequences. It can be dormant in the body for several years and then wake up again. And this is a very good escamotage to tackle the long term consequences of the pandemic, you know, just to see how uh, the long term impact it can have on society. Wow. So it doesn't sound like a very cheerful book. <laughs> No, but it's very well written. Okay. Is it set in kind of a present day setting or does it have a historical feel or? I really thought, you know, just it really felt, you know, like something that might have been right in our times. Who are some of the characters? Edith is an artist and uh, she's an artist well versed in the art of show Sugiban, which is a Japanese art. We talked about this offline and I had never heard of it, but it's a type of wood preservation technique. Never heard of it. There's pictures online. I've never, don't remember ever seeing it. So you actually know much more about it than I do. Please tell us. <laughs> so what she does, it is uh, the art of blackening wood, of charring it uh, to make it more resistant. And that really becomes uh, a metaphor for who we are because we are scarred, we are damaged, and yet we become more resilient because of that. And that is the whole idea. In fact, burn coat has a lot to do with that. And there are a lot of images of a, a fire burning in the book, you know, and actually they do refer to this damage that actually makes us stronger. And it is also sad that it brings out the most beautiful parts of the wood, this technique, and this is what she's aiming to do, like, you know, just really to show our humanity. You know, just the two main themes are impermanence, our mortality. She's confronted with that. Important characters in the novel are, apart from Edith, her mother. Her mother was a writer herself. She suffered from a stroke early in life, but then she really started going again, you know, and, uh, and that is uh, like an example, like we really see, like, you know, just her resilience, we are confronted with this body falling apart, but then with the way that she pulls herself together and start writing again, that's one thing. Also, another very important character is uh, Halit, her lover. It's a man uh, that uh, she didn't know uh, very well when the pandemic started and with whom she actually did spend the pandemic in her studio in Burn Coat, which is this you know, just beautiful, strange building. And the, the same theme in permanence and uh, resilience are there. So we actually get to explore the connectedness, uh, you know, just the way that uh, we want to be connected as a way of... Uh, overcoming, you know, just this mortality that we get to experience. And I hear it's a 
quite a sexy book, and some people described it as quasi-pornographic. What do you think, Kira? Well, um, yes, some people said, you know, just maybe it is very explicit. Um, her art, um, in its art, the artist's art, her sculptures are actually considered uh, uh, really obscene. Uh, they give out too much. And also her relationship with Alit, you know, just is very explicit. You know, she doesn't really hold back from describing, but in my opinion, she's really exploring Eros, you know, and what is it, you know, just it is a life affirming principle, you know, what really keeps us going, our passions, what keeps us alive, you know, just as opposed to this mortality that we see around us and we experience. So what is it that makes life worthwhile living? What is it that makes us go on? And it is like these passions and this is what she immortalizes in her art. That's fantastic. So it's infusing both her relationship with this sexy guy, but also in infusing uh, and shaping, literally. Her art. Yes, indeed, yes. Now, so I really uh, saw there was like a parallel there between what is going on in the novel and the art in these cultures. So deeming sexual content in a work of fiction gratuitous or offensive, it's a very subjective thing, but it certainly didn't bother you, and I don't think it's going to bother me. I'm seeing in your review and another of my Goodreads friends, both of you were reluctant to really say too much about the trajectory of the plot, that it's something that the reader needs to experience for themselves. Well, exactly. You know, just it's given in retrospect. So at the beginning, I can tell how it starts, you know, just it's her looking back on her life. But, you know, we don't really want uh, to uh, tell too much about uh, sure. uh, the what, what their destiny is. Like, we know how it ends, you know, just what we really see to need to see for ourselves what uh, this trajectory is going to be like. I said and it was kind of half in jest that it didn't sound like a very happy book. Somebody who has that reaction, hearing a little bit about the book, what would you say to them? No, it is a very life-affirming book, as a matter uh -huh. of fact, because what is really explored is resilience. Um, the uh, relationship with this man is just so intense, and we really see the desire to connect, you know, just the desire of not letting go of life, uh, despite of everything that is going on. So I would say that it is a very intense novel, not necessarily negative, quite the opposite, I think, you know, just because it really does explore all the things you know that make life worth living in my opinion sounds very much like a sean book kira thank you very much thank you i am delighted to welcome laura from illinois back to bite-sized book chats i think this might be appearance number three but maybe i've lost count laura <laughs> hello hello how are you i'm great you had a fabulous trip to iceland I did. It was gorgeous. Wow. And you did some fa f quite fabulously literary things when you were there. Can you give us one of the literary highlights? Sure. Probably one of the neatest moments was stopping at a location where there was, there's a book called The Voyage of a Woman Traveler. And she was a woman, she was actually Leif Erikson's sister-in-law, but she traveled all over the world um, roughly a thousand years ago. And we got to stop and see the, where her farm had been and the monument to her. Wow. So that was just like a neat little, like you pull off the road and think a thousand years ago, here's this woman who was traveling all around the world. Um, yeah. And her book is in my nonfiction November TBR. So oh, oh, fabulous. Now, do you have a picture uh, that would be representative of that experience that I can put in this video? Yes, I will you can, send you a picture. And you read a book that I'd never heard of. I've never heard of the author. And apparently it's a very popular book that I have just missed hearing about. It's called All the Lonely People by Mike Gale. And while it came out in the UK in the summer of 2020, it just came out in the States in July of this year. And you loved it. And I want you to tell me and everyone else all about it. Sure. So he was a new to me author also. And I was surprised to see how many books he had that I hadn't heard of. So I've definitely got to go back and track down more of his work. But in All the Lonely People, uh, there's an 84-year-old man, Hubert, and he spends most of his time alone in his house. And every week he looks forward to his call with his daughter, Rose, who's a professor in Australia. And then suddenly Rose says that she's going to come and visit him. And he's panicking because for the last six years, he's been making up stories about the friends that he hangs out with. Oh, 
so that she doesn't worry about him. And he's, when he sits down to talk with her, he's got a notebook where he keeps track of what he tells her. And they have these delightful conversations and he's making all of it up. So once she decides that she's going to come visit, he says he's got to go out and find some real friends <laughs> because he doesn't want to own up to what he's been telling his daughter. That so- is a fabulous premise for a novel. Does he ask, and we don't want to move into spoiler territory, but I don't yeah. think this would be too spoilery. Does he ask the people that he's asking to uh, to pretend to be his friends or that he becomes friends with to assume the names that he'd been using in these years of, of uh, updates to his daughter? <laughs> no, he doesn't. He, oh. his, his philosophy is that if he can find some friends that are real and just introduce them, it'll like offset the fact that Dorothy and and these three people that he's spun these yarns about are not real. So he's, he's kind of hoping to like replace them <laughs> in the storytelling. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So it really is this like lovely story about loneliness and how people cope with being isolated, how people find connection. There's so much of it that was heartwarming. There's parts that are heartbreaking, mm-hmm. but I kind of put your heart back together again while you go. So it's okay. <laughs> Now, Mike Gale, I'd never heard of him, but he is a black British author and his, and yes. I think his heritage goes back to Jamaica and the protagonist here, the 84 year old, is he 84? He's 84, I think. The 84 year old protagonist is a Jamaican British guy. I think he mm-hmm. immigrated to the UK in the fifties, maybe. Right. Part of the Windrush generation came right. to the UK um, dealt with the racism and things there, met a, a white woman working in a department store. They fell in love, mm-hmm. got married, raised a family, had this wonderful life together. Um, but it, it their marriage ostracized her from her family for the entire rest of her life. Wow. Um, so they really forged a life and family and partnership together um, mm-hmm. and had that for many years. I mean, the book opens, you know, he's a widower. So you know that at some point he, you know, that she's, she passed away, but there's just such like a connection between the two of them. That was kind of them against the world, which was just a lovely thing to read. Is the daughter an actual character in the novel? In other words, is it kind of two voices or? No, it's just his perception. You just get like, he'll tell you, you, the third person narrator tells you about the conversation, but you don't get her perspective on the situation. And then and that, and that worked for you? It did. It worked really okay. well for me. Um, this, mostly because you get this idea of like, what does a parent think about their conversation with their kids and trying not to make their kid worry? And he thinks about what would his wife want him to say to his daughter? There's really it's kind of some tender moments in that. Now, it sounds like such a Sean book. It also raises a, a few alarm bells for me that it is the kind of story that could be overly sentimental. And I don't think it would have worked for you if it, if it had been overly sentimental. But what, what do you say? From um, that? I don't know that I would say it was overly sentimental, but I don't think it was particularly subtle <laughs> sentimentality. Right. But I had read several heavy books. I mean, while there's certainly parts in this that just made me want to cry at moments, I needed a book that made me feel good <laughs> at that point, And it did that. So that was what I wanted. What, do you know anything else about the author? I, you know, I, when I went... After I liked this one so much, I went back to see like what else had he written and he, <laughs> scrolling through Goodreads and there's a lot listed, um, many of which are rated pretty highly. So it's a treat to find a new, find an author that's got a lot of backlist. Um, yeah. And so I'm excited to kind of go, go in and look for more of his work. I had never heard of him. He's not that old. He was born in the 70s in his... The, the, usually the bios on Goodreads of the authors are mm-hmm. written by the publisher or whatever. <laughs> this one is, he, it's first person. And he says, I was born in the seventies. The seventies were great. I would recommend them to anyone. <laughs> so we know Do you get that kind of tone, a feel for his kind of writing with that. Well, this is great, Laura. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Thank you. I enjoyed talking with you. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome yet another Litzy buddy onto Bite Size Book Chess. This is Reggie from Española, New Mexico. Reggie, welcome. 
Thank you so much, Sean. Thanks for having me. We have been, you know, trading the occasional comment, and I think you have ribbed me a time or two about how often I bail when I do a bail review right. on Litzy. And uh, right. at first, yes, but then it became a. Uh, you inspired me to bail on my own books. That would have trapped me. So I have to say a big thanks to you, man. Oh, yeah. My pl- pleasure to be of service. <laughs> I'm a bad influencer. You read a lot of stuff that isn't my cup of tea, but you also, our tastes do overlap, definitely. And I was waiting, biding my time, waiting for the right book that you had read and reviewed on Litzy that was a Sean book enough that I wanted to get you on to talk about it. And it's a book that I own and haven't yet read. And it is Learning to Talk to Plants by Marta Orioles, a Catalan writer. And it's translated from the Catalan by... Uh, Mara Faye Leth- Letham or Latham and published in English 2020. The, the Catalan edition came out a couple of years before and you loved it. I did. You know, like you said, I usually read a lot of horror and the way the world's going. I feel like horror is where I'm comfortable at right now. But every once in a while, uh, I need to step out of the genre. And there's a bookstore about 35 miles away from where I live in Santa Fe. It's called Garcia Street Books. If you're ever a tourist in Santa Fe, that street that that bookstore is on is where all the pink blossoms and the adobe gates that you see in photos, that's where that store is at. But they have a lot of books in translation that I never would have heard of if I just hadn't stepped in that little store. Mm. And this was one of those gems. And I'm, I'm one of these guys that picks up a book and I'll read like two or three pages and this one hooked me. So I took that's, it home with me. That's awesome. And it has a really compelling opening premise. Tell us the opening premise. Sure. So basically, the whole book is a year of grief, basically. The main character's name, her name is Paula, but for Spanish reasons, I'm just going to say Paula the whole time. But Paula met her partner of 12 years for lunch. His name is Maro. And Maro proceeds to tell her, hey, I'm sorry, but I'm leaving you for another woman. And she goes home. And four hours later, she gets a phone call saying that Maro has been killed in an accident. He rides his bike everywhere. And a vehicle hits him and he dies. And so there's all kinds of conflicting emotions she goes through. Like, of course, you're going to feel like devastated that this partner of 12 years is now gone. But then add the complexity of he was going to leave you because it was cheating on you with another woman. If you don't mind, I kind of want to read just a page. This is actually in the middle of the book, but it kind of puts you where she's at. Yeah, great. Please go ahead. So in this passage where Paolo wavers between anger and sadness, uh, also as mentioned is the other woman and her name is Carla. Since you've been gone, all I expect from the telephone are offers to change service providers and tragedies. The ring still scares me every time. I'm shrouded in that still, still scares me. I still wake up gasping for breath. I still turn every time I pass a bicycle. Without thinking, I still set the table for two on Friday evenings. When I do crossword puzzles, I still reach for your hand on the sofa and ask you six letters to rain and fine drops. I still sigh when I get no response. I still reread the text that says, I would run away with you if I could, Carla. I still look at the video of her blowing you a kiss from a rubber dinghy about to go down some rapids, dressed in neoprene, wearing a life vest and a helmet, laughing and splashing the screen. I still blush when my name pops up as an annoyance in your chats. And now, when I answer the phone after the shock of the first ring, if they're calling from the bank asking for you or for the head of the household, you know what, Maro? Now I enjoy saying out loud that you aren't here. And I so hope that they'll insist a little more and that they'll ask when is a good time to reach you so I can tell them that you won't be home, that you're dead. Now I enjoy giving them that small shock and I chafe against their condolences when they say, I'm so sorry, ma'am, forgive me. And I hang up and there's the void again. And I still charge your mobile and leave it at a hundred percent battery and then wait for it to get all used up as if you were real and those trivial things were keeping you alive. And so I just feel like that pretty much sums up the emotion she's wavering between. You know, she's so angry at what he had done, but there's that love and that missing of him that she still has. So. It's and it's that way throughout the whole book. There'll just be sometimes she thinks she's moving on and little things will remind her of the loss. It's it's so good. That is a really powerful little chapter. Yes, it's a 
novel about very complicated grief. Right. What's the tone? Is the tone always very kind of intense and emotional and serious? No. And I will say this, like it's all over the place, but in the best ways possible. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's going to be some sadness. And I, there were times when I cried for Paola, but then there were times where I wish there had been something next to my bed so I could throw it against the wall for her. And then there were times where I laughed because Paola herself is torn between all these emotions. You know, they always say the, the first holidays are the worst. And so she's at her dad's house. And one of the crazy cousins has a new crazy girlfriend. And that crazy girlfriend takes it upon herself to tell Paola, hey, they told me what happened to you. I just want to give you my condolences. Mm-hmm. And Paola... <laughs> I love her because, you know, she lets it off with a smile and says, thanks. But it's written in the page in her mind. She says, I wonder how much longer I'm going to have to deal with this bullshit, you know? And I, I think everybody can, they know how that feels. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, Is it a spoiler to explain the title? No, no, it's not. Her and Mauro live in a, they lived in an apartment with a terrace. And the terrace was basically where he grew all his plants and now that he's passed they're all dying and she every time she looks outside on the terrace she's reminded of Maro and how he would talk to them and he even had like these dried leaves of certain plants he would make for teas and she it sparks a memory where he's telling her like hey this plant doesn't like that much sun so we got to move it can you help me Paula and she starts laughing and she tells him like Maro, like our our uh, neighbors, they're starting to think the Amazon is on our terrace, man. Like, and he's like, "Shut up and help me move this," and they laugh about it. So there's all these like wonderful memories, but yeah, that's where basically the title comes from. Is she's trying to bridge the gap to him still? Do you know anything about the author? No, I do not. All I know, like I said, I just picked it up at that store. This is her second novel. Okay, and. Everything that basically is on the internet about her is basically on the back page of the book. Yeah. So I really haven't heard about her. Spanish writer based in Barcelona, and she's Catalan. So that's a kind of a contested ethnicity within Spain with its own uh, political complications. Uh, Has her other novel been translated? No, I don't think so. I think this is her only one. Yeah, well, it sounds very interesting. I bought it when I heard the premise. It's been sitting on my shelf for a few months, and you have... uh, made it all the more urgent that I get to it. Oh, great. I'm glad. It, it deserves to be read. Yeah. And I just tell people, don't shy away thinking it's just going to be a sad, sad novel, because it's not. It's much more than that. It's funny. It's sad. It's rage-inducing. There's a wonderful cast of characters who are her support in this. And I just want to shout out her dad, because that dad, the thing is, she's not a stranger to grief. Her mother passed away from cancer when she was seven years old. And so, but back then they knew she was sick and they had time to prepare and time to say goodbye. So it's a little bit different, but her dad had to raise a little girl on his own. And there's just so many ways he comes into her life where he almost shoves his face in her life. Just telling her like, look, I'm trying to do the best I can to make you feel like you have two parents, whether you like it or not. And he is so funny sometimes because he's that weather parent where like he'll leave uh, messages on her phone saying like, hey, just let you know, Barcelona is going to be really windy this this weekend. So be careful driving. And she's like, OK, dad, <laughs> thanks. But he comes from such a place of great love. And even though he wasn't perfect, the fact that he tried made him perfect. You know what I mean? So it's and there's other characters like her work people. And then I just want to say about this novel that. I really enjoy the fact that because I think in America, we come from a Disney-fied place where love will save you. Wait for your white knight. Uh, Paula is a neonatologist. She's a pediatrician. She's successful on her own. She never got married. She doesn't have kids. And those were all choices she made. And the other thing I would like to put out there is that there is a love interest in here where the Disney-fied person in me was like oh maybe he will save her and no the the great surprise to me was that he didn't i love that term disneyfied that's wonderful Re- reggie you are an absolutely uh, phenomenal guest will you come back i will next time i pick a non-horror sean mooney book sure definitely well and in fact here i'll make you a 
I'll make you a deal. I'll, I'll make a proposition. If you read a horror novel that you think I might actually like, you are carte blanche invited to come back on and try to sell me on it. How's that? That sounds great. Sounds like a plan, Sean. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.